So Arjun, welcome to Startup Brain and thanks for joining us. <laughs> thank you, thank you for having me. It's a great opportunity. So Arjun, you started uh, Profounders in 2012. You yeah. graduated from Chengnur Engineering College in 2010 mm -hmm. and found a dream job in Infosys. Mm -hmm. For many, yeah. <laughs> a dream job for many. Um, but after two years, you decided to quit and start Profounders. So what made you quit your job and start a company? Right. Now, it's interesting. Um, Infosys was a great job, by the way. You know, uh, I don't know whether that was my dream job or maybe I didn't even have a dream job at that point of time. Um, what happened is during my college days, I, I like you said, I was in College of Engineering, Chengenur. So here, the college as such encourages you to do a lot of activities. It's a semi-government college, so you don't have a lot of leverages like a private college. So you do everything, right from uh, cleaning the floor up till organizing that event, you do everything. I have literally done all of those things. I have literally took off my shirt and you know, cleaned the uh, floors like that I have done in my college. So I always had this uh, good satisfactory feeling when you start some idea of your own, execute it to, in, into an event or an initiative and then it succeeds, somebody will get a good feeling, somebody gets some value out of it. I always enjoyed that. So a startup initially for me was an idea that I have that will grow into something that will impact a lot of other people. So that was my feeling about startup. And during our college days, the same team, the same Profoundist team, um, had a, something like a small student startup. Uh, it was, we wouldn't call it a startup, it's more like a side business for pocket money stuff. Uh, we used to do websites, uh, web hosting services for a few local clients. Um, we ran it from 2008 till 2010 uh, until we graduated. So, you know, it was there, we wanted to do something of our own. And in 2012, um, for some reason, I had that epiphany of you know, doing something. I just called up my old folks and I said, hey, you know what guys, you wanna come out? They said, oh yeah, okay, let's do it. And we did it, that's about it. So when we when, when we started the startup, I had absolutely no clue what a startup is all about. In fact, I don't even know whether I knew the word startup, yeah. right? I, it was more like a company starting for me, right? And I didn't even know about how to register a company, what is equity, what is investment. I, I knew pretty much nothing. So it was a very clear slate. All I had was I was willing to put in 25 hours out of the 24 hours uh, along with a good team. You know, we had a good team with well-rounded skills. That's all we had. So I don't have any background. I've never done business or sales or any of the business functions. Um, I was just pretty much a fresher, just under two years from Infosys. Okay. And we started with a clean slate. So you talked about the team. So what are the most important things that one should keep in mind while uh, you know inviting people to be on board as co-founders? Right. They say it's like marriage. Yeah, it's. Uh, I agree to it. It's like a marriage. Uh, but then you choose to be in that marriage. Yeah. That's the key thing. Um, I believe that uh, to me, ethics is the top priority. You know, you cannot sleep well with a guy who you think will backstab you, right? Yeah or who will end you up in jail, right? Mm. So to me, ethics is the first thing. That is co-founder or anybody whom you are working with, partners, anybody, ethics is my primary thing. Uh, the second thing would be how complementary are their skills with yourself. You don't want everybody with your skills, right? In, in my profoundest example, I was good at presentations or sales or talking to people, uh, and I had absolutely no uh, coding skills. I, I don't have anything, I cannot code. Uh, but Joe Finn, our operations guy, he used to have a bit of coding and a bit of functional skills. So he was a semi-business, semi-techie uh, semi guy. And then our technology officer, Anoop, he is a core techie. You know, he, he doesn't actually understand the whole lot of business, but if I tell him to build a rocket, then he can build that rocket. He's really deep, good guy. And the fourth person, Nitin, he was a, he was a get it done guy. Uh, he could, if I tell him something, he can do that and he was willing to take up additional responsibilities. Like for example, when we started off, we wanted somebody to take up finance. I was not a numbers guy, I'm not a numbers guy, I cannot do it. So Nitin just took it up. So we had a kind of complementary skills. We had the design, uh, you know, when you say about startup, you want to do making and selling. Yeah. You know, you, the team should have both, and our team had both. So uh, the complementary skills is probably the second thing that you're looking for. The third and probably very important as well is grit. They shouldn't quit. Yes. Right? They shouldn't quit on the company, the business, or on you. They should just be there. Over the past four years, obviously we have had a lot of downs than ups, right? Every other day, something will get uh, screwed. Uh, nobody wanted to quit. Nobody, never ever has anybody talked about quitting and joining. We have had, I don't know, 
ट्वेंटी जॉब्स टुगेदर फॉर पीपल गॉट ट्वेंटी जॉब अपॉर्चुनिटीज इन फोर इयर्स मे बी वेरी वेरी लुक्रेटिव वंस वेरी गुड कंपनीज बट एवरीबडी वॉज लाइक शोइंग दिस एंड देन मेकिंग फंड ऑफ ईच अदर दैट्स वेरी मच एट सो आई थिंक द थर्ड वन इज दैट नो क्विडिंग एटीट्यूड यू नीड टू हैव दैट इन इन पीपल फॉर मेकिंग योर कंपनी सक्सेस So let's uh, move on to your product. Why? Mm -hmm. But before that, mm -hmm. I believe it was not your first product. You mm -hmm. did come up with a couple of other products and services. Sure. So what happened to them? Um, they successfully failed. <laughs> in short, uh, what happened is, um, as I said, we were starting off with a white slate, right? Um, I believe uh, it's this is my theory. There are two ways to start a company. One is young and uh, young and stupid. The third is old and wise. Oh, sorry. Second is old and wise. So. Uh, we belong to the former one the young and stupid folks we were young we didn't know what to do but we were willing to put whatever it takes to build whatever is needed right that kind of an attitude so we started off uh, in a typical bootstrapping fashion uh, we had a client from turkey we started generating revenue rise since the first month we whatever little we had put in we broke even in the third month and we have been cash flow positive ever since so we kind of managed that cash flow first for the first 3 4 months then started working on the first product or conceptualizing the first product uh that is when we got selected to microsoft ventures bangalore we went there and then we realized that the product that we are thinking there are another 350 products doing the exact same thing right there is no chance for a 350 first product to be something that the others cannot right and they are well funded all those good things uh, so it was a difficult space and it is actually we were laggards in that uh, model so we had to pivot that is probably the first one the e even before that we had an idea uh, which we conceptualized again that was a financial and sales analytics kind of a tool but as the people who are building that product we had absolutely no clue about yeah. the domain right we didn't know about finance we didn't know about sales so we cannot resonate to that problem statements so we cannot build it right as good so that was there then emotion which was the you know 350 other products that also didn't take off the third product we actually built end to end um, it was a social testimonial management system um we got a lot of people to use it uh, close to um 400 odd companies tried it out from 30 countries around um they used it on a freemium model but once the payment thing was there everybody was like this is a good thing to have but it's not a must have right so uh, we will not pay it, the it's not solving a pressing enough problem statement for us um so being an indian company you really don't have the leverage to push something that doesn't generate revenue for a long time that was the thought process and we decided to shelf that product also that was the third one and uh, while i was doing the sales and marketing for um, that particular product i testify it was cold the third one I realized that the sales people need to have a lot of context, you know, about the people and about the organizations. That was a fundamental problem statement of Vibe. Sales people yeah. need to have enough contextual information about people and organizations to perform better. So I I thought if I have that problem being a sales guy, there might be more people and we just put a launch rock page out there say hey, do you have this problem? Close to 300 people came into that website. and 97 people signed up and we thought okay maybe we are on to something that's how why this started. happened organically ah uh, not organically okay. what happened is we we were uh, we started engaging into conversations on linkedin and twitter um, honestly uh, being very frank if you go to cora and search for preeti krishna there's a profile she talks about vibe and that is me <laughs> yeah cuz i just wanted to drive some relevant traffic and when people were asking how can i find information about people i just went there hey you know what we are building this new product why don't you check it out okay and it it kind of pushed people to the launch rock page so we drove relevant traffic to that uh, page okay. and we got conversions we started engaging into conversations with that 97 people that was the kind of customer interview that's how vibe started off That's an interesting story. Okay, so you got the idea from Vibe when you were trying to shut down the second product that third product. Third product. Yeah. Because you realized there's a problem that needs to be fixed. Right. That's how you came to Vibe. But yeah. uh didn't it have the same problem as the third product where there were already other companies who were trying to solve this mm -hmm. issue? Right. So one thing that we have across the journey that one thing that I have uh agreed to with the rest of the folks is um 
we we don't worry about competition okay. we are mindful about them but we don't worry about it what we feel is um, if we are building something valuable enough for the customers then we'll be fine you know so that was the thought process so once we had that initial interest from people it kind of told us that there might be a few things out there but then if people are still coming into this people are still asking questions on quora on linkedin about the same problem statement then something needs to be fixed there okay. right and personally i could resonate to that problem statement i wanted to solve my problem so i was like hey guys why don't we solve my problem you know and it, through that we might actually solve a lot of people problem um so i think that is why we didn't worry about the competition we were like we will put some mvp the minimum viable product out there people started using it and then we heard customers you know none of us were steve jobs okay. so we really had to listen to our customers we just listened to the users early customers pivoted how they wanted we started learning about the domain quite a bit um and that's how we took vibe to the next next levels okay could you please tell us more about vibe and how it's bringing value to the customers who are using it sure so vibe uh, is essentially a business to business data intelligence tool it will help the sales it used to help the sales and marketing people to understand better about their prospective customers or existing customers to give an example um you know if you have an email address of a person uh you could just give that email address to us we'll automatically go to the public web get all the information about that person and then get them together into a dashboard and put it back to you in a, in less than 3 seconds so that is an algorithm we only cover the public data and gets it back to you so it essentially you know if you are thinking about a crm customer relation management software where you, where you have 100000 contacts you cannot search for all these 100000 people and without knowing who these people are you cannot nurture them you cannot qualify them you cannot essentially sell well to them you know yeah. whether you are a marketing guy or a sales guy so you just give all these email ad- ids to us we'll give you the data your crm will be full you can put your communication to better context you clearly mentioned about taking public data but still it's data and how do you deal with the privacy issues right yeah so this is one question we get for all obvious reasons uh, one of the things that we do is we never infringe on privacy at all we all the data that we give is out there if you google then you can find that data all we are doing is we are intelligently pulling them together right if you search for my email on google with the relevant keywords you will start getting the data if you go through seven pages you will still find about me right but going to seven pages you will take 30 to 40 minutes yeah. we are giving it to you in 3 seconds okay so we are not actually generating any data we are a smart aggregation of data and putting them together into a visually decipherable model you know in a, in a quick snapshot kind of a thing so that you will understand that person as and then make your contextual sell so you're telling me that you have never had any issues with privacy poli- policy not really so we have had a, a, a people asking us and we have had cases where um, so we had a profile ed- editor with vibe where we give full access to our users so if somebody feels that this data is outdated or this data shouldn't be there they could simply go there change their data or even remove their profile entirely from vibe so we used to give all the uh, uh, um control to the users and the chrome plugin that we have uh, which a lot of users use more than 100000 users um the chrome plugin never read anything more than what it should just the email right there are plugins out there who kind of spies data and gets data out of your inbox linkedin or facebooks but we were very clear we never did any of those things so there were people asking questions but once we reply with the kind of uh, that reply that i just yes. gave you they were kind of happy yeah, about it yeah it's pretty it. much very convincing <laughs> yeah. yeah so we never had any issues as such with privacy policies so one of the first milestones uh, for profoundus was getting into startup village could you please tell us about the facilities and the support that you got from startup village and how important was it for you to grow as a startup in kerala right, particularly yeah. so startup village was awesome um when we were st- so startup village probably started 3 months before we started okay. we were the third incubated company in startup village was it easy to get in um not very difficult <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so i just went in i met sujo uh, he was the ceo then um the vision that startup village drew in front of us was really compelling right you know they were really after building a product ecosystem a silicon cost in india so that was interesting yeah. and uh, he, i think he also liked the team that we have because we had the necessary skill sets um and i think that is where we connected well um and that is how we got incubated when we got incubated the best thing was um we didn't have a lot of money right when we started 
um, each of us put 30,000 rupees each, the four people, so 1,20,000, 120,000 rupees is all we have. And we were taking 3,000, 4,000 rupees salary each so that we can leave. So Startup Village essentially supported with the office space. That is the first thing. They never took rent for quite some time. That is a huge help, you know, when yeah. you look back. Um, we had a lot of high profile visits to Startup Village in the initial days. We met a lot of good people. We started pitching. Obviously, we were horrible in the initial days to pitch our product. When people talk about value proposition, it really went over top. <laughs> I, I had no clue what a value proposition is. So it took a bit of time and that was good training ground for us. Right? Um, then Startup Village was, the community was good. If you look at the early Startup Village people, the first, uh, first few incubators at Startup Village, they are still alive and kicking. Because right? the community is so big, the friendship is there, we still try to contribute to each other. And, you know, that community was the feeling good factor. I still have a Facebook album that says Startup Village is fun. Mm -hmm. You know, so that kind of a feeling was there. Um, then I think uh, one of the major helps that we got was when we got selected to Black Box Connect in the Silicon Valley. So I think we were the first company in India to get selected to that program. But the program had a fee and somebody had to pay it because we didn't have money. So we told Startup Village, uh, Kerala government supported us. But the facilitation was entirely through Startup Village. I never had to go anywhere. Right? That is Interesting. huge. Right? I mean, I had absolutely no clue how to make that money. But Startup Village facilitated the whole it's thing. It's a two-week program. And was it very expensive? It, was, it wasn't very expensive. But still, that was expensive for a small Startup, company. Yeah. And it is dollar to India conversion. So yeah. that makes it big. Um, so that was a big help. Uh, yeah, then I think the initial branding of Startup Village was yeah. really helpful. One of the investors that later invested in our company found us from Startup Village website. Okay. And it was an inbound query to Profondi saying that, hey, you know what, do you want me to invest? I'm like, okay. oh, hey, yes, you know, why don't you invest? Okay. And so that does happen. So we have got- More visibility. Visibility, yeah. yeah. So there has been a lot of, uh, um, I wouldn't call all the um, benefits that we got as tangible benefits. There has yeah. been a lot of intangibles too. But I still believe that Startup Village was possibly one of the best things that happened to Kerala. Uh, yes. in, in terms of the cultural change, the society taboo was taken out, right? Uh, 2012, when we started, the startup wasn't a cool thing. Uh, 2013, Startup Village changed it, right? Mm -hmm. Kerala started being more receptive to startups, mm -hmm. right? And then we have actually hired people through Startup Village. Mm -hmm. As in, people came together in Startup Village as a community. That is where we got to meet really good people. Um, Nakul, who, is our, who was our VP of technology with Profound, is we found him in Startup Village. Um, he came in as a product engineer, then he was a senior product engineer, then he went to the VP of technology. Really, really good guy. So people like that uh, we found in Startup Village. This has happened for multiple startups, not only ours. So yeah, it has been really, really good experience working with Startup Village. So in addition to Startup Village, mm -hmm. you have also been to Microsoft Ventures, yeah. which is an accelerator program. That's right, yeah. And you mentioned the Black Box. Yeah. Um, and Startup, startup Chile. Chile. Yeah. So you've been to a lot of different programs mm -hmm. and you would be the best person mm -hmm. to do a comparative analysis on mm -hmm. the benefits and uh, advantages, disadvantages of all these programs. Right. So if you could briefly tell us about sure. the same. Mm, so one of the things about any of these uh, incubators slash accelerators is the stage at which you, what you are, right? And what do you need? Um, in my case, when we reached Startup Village, we were figuring it out, right? So we wanted somewhere to sit not pay money and figure it out. Startup Village was the perfect place for that. And Cochin, you know, it's very, very less expensive in Cochin compared to Bangalore or Valley or Delhi or anywhere you take. So Startup Village was amazing in that sense. Um, Microsoft Ventures was the place where we started getting the startup gyan, right? We, we got a lot of information. We learned about quick prototyping, minimum viable product, lean startup methodologies, um, product validations, um, investment connects, angel investment, a lot of these startup gyan we got from Microsoft Ventures. And we wanted that because we didn't yeah. know anything. Um, and then all the connections that I've made was from Microsoft Ventures. I know a lot of people in Indian ecosystem. Uh, the good thing is everybody will walk into this Microsoft Ventures space and will come to your desk and ask, hey, what are you guys doing, right? And when people are trying to find an investor, get trying to get two minutes to pitch to them, these folks will come down to your desk and ask you what you're doing. So that's a casual interaction than a pitching happening. So that kind of fostered the relationships. So Microsoft Ventures is amazing in that sense. And they don't take equity out of you. So none of the programs that I've been to, I've chosen in awesome. such a way that I don't take, they don't take equity. And Microsoft Ventures used to give us breakfast and lunch, very good food for six months. 
and uh, uh, they used to give us the Microsoft guest house for staying in Bangalore wow. uh, in Microsoft guest house. So you have no excuse for failing if you're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So th they just make you feel really comfortable and yes. they treat you at good places like Butterfly and then um, Beer Club and all these good places. Uh, so they make you feel comfortable, takes away a lot of overheads out of you so that yeah. you can focus where you really want to. Um, Startup Chile, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen your pictures. Looks like you really had an awesome time. Oh yeah, we had absolutely nice time in Startup Chile. We were one of the top 15 in, awesome. in that batch. Um, the good thing about Startup Chile is if you get selected, you get 40,000 US dollars yeah. and no equity. Right? It's Chilean government granting you 40,000 yeah. dollars. That essentially helped us to stop services, focus only on product. Right. I was there in Chile, you know, saving all the money as much as possible. I was living around $13 per day, you know, just eating rice and uh, pickle. Um, but I was saving as much money as possible so that I can send it to India. That turned out to be our operational money for close to 12, 14 months. Okay. Uh, we sh stopped services, focused on product, vibe really sped up. On top of that, um, Startup Chile will get you connected with a lot of global founders. We have an online dashboard. If you put any question there, you get an answer. You know, you want to uh, know about IP or or uh, attorneys or legal stuffs. You host a question there, and you get answers. Yeah. So that's like a global founder network. Right? That was valuable. And then I know a lot of people. I have advised a few companies that got selected to start up Chile, and all of them learned quite a bit. Traveled there, been in a different ecosystem, uh, got a lot of founders from different places to come together. The co-working space is quite good. Um, so they also got a lot of startup GAN from Chile also. Uh, Blackbox Connect was our entry to the valley. Right? Yeah. That is the first time uh, we got entry to the valley. We got the culture. You know, the I, I understood the speed at which things move. I took three months to decide whether I should sunset, I testify or not, and I decided in one and a half weeks in the valley. Yeah. Right? I just decided this is not going to take off, mm -hmm. right? and then this is the time to shut this down, and we shut it down. So. Um, Black Box was that kind of a new Silicon Valley experience. Um, so comparing, I think it would be a bit unfair to compare each of these yeah. people, but you should decide on what you actually want. Yeah. You know, are you in a place where you need prototyping? Go for an incubator. Are you in a place where you need acceleration? Right? Then you decide whether it is B2B acceleration, B2C acceleration. Is it a hardware startup? Then choose your incubator and accelerator. Don't let them choose you. You should do your due diligence being an entrepreneur. Go to places like F6S, uh, GUST, UNoodle, uh, AngelList. Find about these um, companies, uh, sorry, these incubators or accelerators. Read about them. Read about their exits, investments, alumni companies. Then you will know what their strengths are. Then correlate what you need and their strengths, and then choose these programs. There are a lot of them across the world. Yeah, yeah that's my thing. You did talk about. Uh, doing a bit of services initially sure. to keep you up and running but and uh, that's a very popular model that's been followed by yeah. a lot of startups do you think that is the best option or should we always start off with the prototyping and uh, do you think we will be wasting a lot of time doing services because that's a tricky position to be in because money keeps coming in and you really don't want to think about having no money and right. <laughs> you would have no clue what to do next with your product so right uh, the short answer is it depends. Yeah. You know, uh, for us it was very obvious because okay. we had to take some time to figure it out. Yeah. So for somebody who needs to figure it out, I am literally against taking the investor money. So I was obsessed. I just told my team, uh, and they agreed to it that uh, we will have the customer money flowing in first before we even touch investor money. You know, it is very clear. So to me it was obvious. Yeah. I had to bootstrap. But then if you are an experienced person, for example, like um, 35 to 40 years old, you know what you're doing, you know you have the contacts to sell it, you have a family to support, you cannot go to 3,000 rupee salary. Right? In that case, maybe it makes sense to leverage your connections, go raise an angel investment, go build what you really want. Right? So the moment I started realizing the early customer revenues, I raised my round. Because, okay. you know, I, yeah, it happened, it took some time, but I raised. Yeah. Um, so I think the answer is it depends. Um, bootstrapping is good if you need some time, if you need prototyping, you need to learn. Uh, and I would also suggest an incubator for any of those kinds of founders. Yeah. Incubators can really help. Um, if you really know what you're doing, if you're in a scale-up path, go raise investments, don't just burn away. So if you look at the pattern, you know, 
previously, especially in Kerala, it was so mm. difficult to raise money if you right. were a startup. Sure. But now things have changed. Look yeah. at the startup India, startup policy. The Kerala startup mission have also come up with lots of uh, you know policies. The KSIDC, KFC. There are a lot of government uh, financial agencies who are willing to give you money. Sure. And also there are investors. Sure. On the other hand. Sure. What is the right thing to do? Um, you know, people say take money from where it comes from, yeah. uh, and then I, I would I would put it from a different perspective. So we have taken a KFC loan. You know, it was a KSS EDM, which is twenty lakhs Indian rupee without collateral. That has helped quite a bit. You know, in in our case, we were running on uh, four thousand rupee salary when the KFC loan we took, and we raised our salary to thirteen thousand. That was one reason why we didn't burn out, right? Uh, so that helped. But then along with the money, again, you should ask what you need. Is it just the money that you need? If you just need only 20 lakh rupees, go do it. It's fine. But then if you need value, right, you need probably an investor who can put money plus value. Right? I know a lot of startups who have raised strategic money, as in small money or maybe big money, but that investor turned big uh, meetings for them. You know, they, he opened doors or she opened doors so that they got uh, their footstep into big companies, other investors, so on and so forth. So it depends on what you actually need. Uh, raising money from here and there is fine, but you should really look at the terms. Again, that is probably one of the other things. Is there a collateral? Is it a personal loan? Is it on you or is it on the company? Um, what is your moratorium? When do you start paying back? When, you know, you need to have the cash flow to pay it back, right? Yeah. So those kinds of things you should be mindful about. And then uh, choose wisely uh, on, on where you take money. Mm -hmm. I don't think one is better than the other. It depends on your situation. Yeah. Yeah. And hypothetically, if you're a startup mm -hmm. and uh, you're going to successfully raise investment, mm -hmm. what are the key things that you should invest money in? Is it on hiring, marketing, infrastructure? What do you think? I know it depends, but still. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm like, oh my God, again, it depends answer. <laughs> it's the third uh, one. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, um, <laughs> I, I, I'm just trying to find another word no, that depends. Uh, but I mean, if it's for vibe. Mm -hmm. we, for, for us, it was, uh, we had to invest on hiring. Because okay. we were a small team, we were only five people, we had to have developers to speed up the process, we, ha we had to hire and we did. And then uh, another thing was that we had to up our salaries a bit more. Yeah. You know, we were running on very small salaries for two to three years, including our team members. Um, so we had to raise a bit of our salary, so we had to pay ourselves, that was one, one thing. Um, then uh, we obviously invest, started investing a bit more into marketing or marketing. sales, trying new things out. You know, we put hundred dollars on some ad to see whether it'll work, yeah. right? Uh, so those kinds of things you have leverage to do those kinds of things. Um, so I think uh, you need to invest uh, very strategically on. But it's mostly on hiring and marketing, I believe. Yeah, for the initial rounds, I think it will be around hiring and sales. You okay. know, that is probably two things that you mostly need as a startup. And then after that? Um, after that, things will change. You know, yeah. there will be a point where you need to start doing marketing than sales. So then yeah. you start investing in marketing, or else there will be a time when you start investing in IPs. You know, in research. Yeah. Maybe you know we have got to we have applied for two patents. Okay. That also happened with the investor money actually. Oh, but then you know about the new law where the government will pay back. Yeah, wish it came earlier. <laughs> so oh, you were too late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were an early startup. We couldn't make use of it. Okay. Um, so yeah, I think one of the things to look at when you raise investment is spent wisely. Uh, for example, for the first 3.5 years, we have never spent even a single penny on servers. Okay. We have we have a huge cluster on servers because yeah. we are a data company. But uh, you know, AWS, uh, Microsoft Azure. Uh, software, IBM, uh, Bluemix, all these people are giving handsome free uh, accounts to you, right? They'll give you, I don't know, $100,000, $120,000 worth of these server spaces. You just take it, right? And we have never spent anything. Okay. And then uh, similar thing for emailing systems. We got first from MailChimp, then from SendGrid. We keep using them even now. We don't pay for anything. Just because you raised money doesn't mean you have to spend on anything and everything, yeah. right? You just got to be mindful enough. You have to, the investor money is as good as your money. So would you put money on this thing if it, it was your money? Right? Mm. Then decide on that. that. That's what I did. I was very, very, uh, we were a very frugal company. You know, We ran lean. Uh, there was never a point in our startup, even now, where the founders are earning more than the rest of the team members. 
always the founders earn less than um, the rest of the team members. Not all of them, but yeah, yeah. we are not the highest paid people. Um, so we invested back to the startup. Yeah. That's how I see it. Excellent. Um, so why Pro Founders was obviously a very growing company. Mm -hmm. So when the news about the acquisition came in, I was like quite surprised and I was not sure whether it's a good news or a bad news. Right. So why did you go in for an acquisition? Good question. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, the growth or uh, there are cases where the growth stalls, you know, the revenue doesn't grow. You, you don't know what to do next and then you get acquired. Yeah. Right? That's definitely one thing. The other thing is you decide that there is a strategic value. You know, if you merge with another company, if you get acquired by this company, then you can actually move very quickly. You can still accomplish what you really want to accomplish a lot more quicker, deliver impact. Yeah. Full contact was that kind of a thing. Okay. So we worked as partners for close to just over a year, I believe. Okay. And our, both of our customers got a lot of value. It was a co-branded partnership where they used our data, we used their data. and um, both of our customers got a lot of value. Then um, it came to a point where if we think aligned, there is a one plus one is equal to th three. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the synergy was kicking in. And that, and we really like the people, you know, the team of Full Contact and our team, we used to merge really well. So we decided, hey, you know what? Why don't we take it another step? So they proposed it and uh, we were open to it yeah. and we, just to just to give a picture, right? We were we are we were serving close to 200 odd companies when we were Profoundis and Vibe. They are serving thousands of customers. Okay. Right. So for me to build something to that level, it would probably take me four to five years or maybe six years. But if I just do this thing, then uh, I suddenly deliver impact to thousands of companies. Right. That was big for me. And then for, I also thought that. Um, the ecosystem, the Kerala ecosystem really needed that story, right? uh, the success. And we knew that it hasn't happened, it was around the corner. We were probably the first in the history, but it's going to happen. So the strategic importance of uh, the acquisition of the ecosystem was again something that was at the back of our minds. The third thing was when an acquisition was on, uh, usually the employees get screwed. Yeah. Right? In our case, we were very clear, no layoffs at all. Okay. They said, yeah, you're right, no layoffs. Okay. So every single uh, employee in um, Profounders, including the founders, we are employees of Full Contact now, and the team is going to grow. All right. Being Profounders, we were looking at growing to 200 to 300 people in two years. Now we are looking at 1,500 to 2,000 people in two years. Right? So that's the accelerated growth, and we will continue to do what we are doing. Full Contact is still a startup. We just raised our Series D. So you know, it's a, it, everything was right. There are certain decisions which feels right, and this was one of those. And um, so far, you know, I, if you give me a chance to do it all over again, I would do it every single time. Okay. <laughs> and uh, by the end of this year, I believe you're moving to US and yeah. to take responsibility as the head of data strategy for Full Contact. Yeah. So, what are you looking forward to? Right. So, I've already assumed the role of head of data strategy, and uh, the information firehose has opened from Full Contact. <coughs> Um, so it, I am looking forward to a lot of learning. Honestly, you know, um, Full Contact is a, it's a, I wouldn't call it a big company, but it's a medium scale, very, very quickly growing company, and uh, probably the best in data across the world. Right, and I know that along with Profoundus capability, we are the best in the world. So I am looking at um, the data strategy, which means it's a very key piece to Full Contact because everything depends on how good our data is, and I am the person who is kind of overlooking, supporting the rest of the people to keep it balanced. Um, so I'm looking uh, to, for a lot of learning. Um, Full Contact is a Bradfield invested company. You know, Bradfield is a guy who all of us looked up to. We used to read his blogs. We used to learn from his blogs. To meet him, to be in connection with him is huge. Our CEO, Bart Lorang, very, very experienced, seasoned veteran guy. Uh, we have had a lot of time with him two weeks back also. He's one of those guys whom you want to work for. And the same goes for our CTO. He's an MIT Stanford, sorry, Stanford MIT Stanford guy. Right? So, and I'm reporting to him. Um, it's, it's a lot of learning in that sense. And being full contact, every other data company in the space wants to talk to us. And we talk to every other person. And I am the person who is doing the, all the talking. So this, the data landscape is in front of me. Right? Entirely across the planet, I'm going to look at the data uh, 
competitive landscape across the world. So I see all these things put together as a great opportunity to learn more. And of course, needless to say about the scaling that we'll do in India, 2,000 people. And the India team is still reporting to me, so I'll be overseeing the India team too. Uh, 2,000 people scaling in two years is going to be super awesome. Uh, it's a roller coaster ride. We are talking about hiring four people per day, <laughs> you know. So that's a lot, that's a lot of hiring. Um, and of course, um, we don't need the culture to be sucked out while we do the hiring. <coughs> Excuse me. So we want to have that culture there. We want to have the scale. We need to have the quality, uh, plus all the other things that I mentioned. I'm just looking forward to it as the biggest learning in my life in my next phase. What an awesome, inspiring startup journey. And all the best wishes and thanks again for joining us. Thank, Thank you, Aisha. Thanks a lot. Yeah.